Thank you, praise team. We'll be opening our Bibles in a moment to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. And uh, I want you to understand as we celebrate in a honoring fashion, I hate the word that celebrate, but as we focus our attention on the honoring of, of those who have given what I refer to as the greater love. And I call that the greater love because the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And we as a nation come and we remember our military and we remember the first responders who have given their lives for that greater love. The scripture says to whom honor is due, to give honor to whom honor is due. And so that's what we want to do. And in the text that we're going to be reading from this morning, we're going to find that the apostle Paul himself was truly a great or a good soldier, as he will refer to it in just a second, because what he's reminding us of and as he writes to Timothy and he uses the soldier as a, an example, he's showing us that we are in a spiritual battle. I think sometimes we as believers kind of get used to living life down here. And we kind of take things for, well, you know, that might have happened, or I don't know the purpose of what that took place for. And I think we kind of forget that some of the battles we're going through are because of spiritual things that are happening in or around our lives. We kind of forget that the Bible says that we are uh, in a fight against wickedness in high places. We find out that the, the Bible teaches us to put on the whole armor of God. That sometimes I think we just need to realize life is a battle. Life is a spiritual battle. And sometimes what happens is we get so caught up in the, separating the spiritual from the earthly. But you realize sometimes that spiritual battle is fought among earthly things. Sometimes that spiritual battle of evil arises in earthly realm and earthly situations. So this morning, that's why we have ourselves having a military, a protection of a country. That's why we see uh, people who will uh, protect their own properties and those kind of things because evil is rampant in this world. And because evil is rampant, Paul tries to write to Timothy and he, uh, on numerous occasions, uses several terms that I'll point out to you in a moment. But the whole logic behind what Paul is writing is he's getting ready to pass away. He knows he's getting ready to pass away. And so he starts talking to Timothy, and he gives him several examples of how to live this Christian life and things that are important to us. And so as we start to think about and draw our attention on uh, those who have given their lives, those who... Uh, have laid down their life and have cost them a lot of uh, sacrifices over the time that we use that analogy of a soldier and it's a perfect time as we are reflecting as a nation to reflect as a church as well upon spiritual warfare. So if you will stand with me together in honor of the word of God, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1. Thou therefore my son be strong in the grace of that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier." You can be seated. We're just going to kind of walk through those four verses together and look at something that Paul kind of lays out. If you're going to be like a good soldier, here's some things you're going to need to have, and here's some characteristics of a good soldier. The very first one that Paul does is, as he memorializes a good soldier, he looks at the good soldier's strength. Notice what he said in verse number one, be strong. I want you to be strong. There are 25 times that Paul encourages Timothy to have a strong endurance and a might about him as he works there in the city of Ephesus. Paul is not trying to get across any other thing than, lesson. spiritual battle takes strength. It takes physical strength, and it takes spiritual strength. And so, Timothy, as you are getting ready to memorialize and look at good soldiers, one of the first things you see about a good soldier is their strength. Be strong 
In fact, listen to what he says in Isaiah 49. He says, Give power, or he giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth will faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But they that wait upon the Lord, I love this verse, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Notice the source of where that strength was supposed to come from. How am I supposed to be strong? Well, he says here, to be strong in what? In the Lord. To be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There's only two true sources of strength today, and that's God. God is the strength, and God's grace is the way that he sends it to you and I. God's grace, as you might understand, is his unmerited favor. That's because God wants to do something good for you, even though you and I don't deserve it. And so where does our strength come from? How do we keep going on in this spiritual battle? How is it that we push a little harder and push a little further and go another mile? Because God's grace. Because God is good to us. Because God gives us that strength to just move just a little bit, push a little farther, push a little harder, be a little stronger. You know where that grace comes from? He tells Timothy to be specific. That grace comes from, or that strength comes from that grace of God. There is something about being able to say, I'm a child of God, and God wants to favor me. I'm a child of God, and God wants to bless me. I'm a child of God, and God wants to use me. I'm a child of God, and God wants to forgive me. I'm a child of God, and He wants to heal me. I'm a child of God, and He wants me to keep going on and on and on, not in my physical strength, because guess what? We can't. But guess what? God can. God can, and God is able. Even though, when we see the grace of God, we have to realize, I do not deserve this. Some of you have experienced God's wonderful grace in so many different ways of your life. So many times we, we want God's grace and we go, well, how did they make it through that trial? And how did they make it through that strategy or, or struggle? How were they so strong by God's grace? And you do realize that sometimes God doesn't give you the grace until you need that grace. Sometimes it surprises you. How did I get through that mess? How did I overcome this situation? How was I able to push through? How was I able to go on a little further? How was I able to stand tall? How was I able to just not quit? Because there's some strength there. And that strength comes from God. Remember the Apostle Paul? He had a struggle. He called it a thorn in the flesh. He asked God to please remove this. And God finally had to break the news to him. My grace is sufficient for thee. Listen to this. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ might rest on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then... Am I strong? The first thing that you want to look at this morning, and you memorialize a good soldier. A good soldier is a strong soldier. A good soldier is one who realizes it's by God's grace. You see, a great military is a great deterrent. That truth is peace through strength. Walk softly and carry a big stick, we've heard them say. But listen, with all the military might we have, God is our strength. God is what it takes. We have seen through history how military fights have gone that absolutely startled the world. How? How in the world has Ukraine fought off Russia for as long as it has? That's an amazing thing. How has little Israel survived just since 1948, all the wars that, and the attacks that have gone on against them. You see, you have to realize something this morning. 
in a spiritual warfare, true strength comes from God's grace. The second thing I want you to notice is found in that second verse. Memorializing a good soldier, you will look at the soldier's commitment. Now, there's a play on words here that the Apostle Paul uses. He says in verse 2, And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. It's the same word that's used twice in there, but we translated it different twice. It literally says, Commit thou to the committed. Commit to the committed. Commit to the faithful. Bring about in treasure to them. Give to them something. Well, who? Who do I want to commit this thing to? Who do I want to commit what I've learned and what I've heard and, and the strength that I've gotten and, and the, the plans that I've gotten and the know-how that I've gotten and the training that I've gotten? What do, you, what do you want me to do with that, Lord? I want you to pass it on. I don't want you to keep it. I don't want you to be selfish with it. My desire as a pastor and a teacher is that you will know more about the Bible than I do. That's my desire. That you will know how to handle spiritual conflict when it comes your way better than I do. Dr. Cruz used to tell me, uh, I spelled the name wrong though, but Dr. Cruz used to tell me that the greatest joy of a professor is watching one of his students out teaching. It is. What a joy to know that what you're teaching, what you're passing on is going to go on to others. There is a true commitment. Not just a commitment within yourself, but what has been committed to you. The treasure that you have, the strengths that you have, the things that have come into your life, the truth that has come into you, pass it on. But who do you pass it on to? You pass it on to others who have commitment. Others who are willing to stand the test. Paul gave a charge to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 12 through 21. Go read that sometime. That's his ordination charge. And that's what Paul's bringing up here. He says, the things which you heard of me among many witnesses. Among many witnesses when Paul stood before Timothy. If you've ever been part of an ordination service, you'll see that Paul will, uh, the, the preacher will preach a charge to the young man who's being ordained into the ministry. And I know that's not politically correct, but it's Bible track. A young man who's been <laughs> ordained to the ministry. And Paul says that what I said to you that day, what I laid into your hands that day, the charge that I gave to you to preach the word, to be instant in season and out of season, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, to not yield to teachers who are having itching ears, not to listen to fables, but to stand firm and to stand true and that Jesus Christ is the way of heaven and that's the only way of heaven and salvation is in the blood of Christ and baptism follows only because of salvation. Teach those things to other men, but don't waste your time. Are you ready for this? Teaching them to the do drop ins. Ow, Brother Rick. He's not talking about the C&E club, amen? He's not talking about the flip-flop in and out of the Baptist church Christianity. He says, I want you to find some faithful people, committed people, and commit to them. Commit to them so that you will know, I'm paying it forward. Would you please pass it on? You see, this, what happens is there's strength, and then there's commitment. We find out the next thing is there's endurance. He says in, in that third verse, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endurance is a fancy word for perseverance. Endurance is a good word for keep on keeping on. Endurance is that word that means I got to go one more step. I got to go one more service. I got to go one more door. I got to go one more child. I got to go and share one more step. I've got to pray one more hour. I've got to push one more time. I got to give just another dollar. I've got to go. I've got to endure hardness. I got to persevere. Notice that that is a command. Thou therefore. It is a must. It is not an option. 
People tell me all the time, Brother Rick, does it bother you when you look out across the audience and see where certain people used to sit? Yes, it does. But it really bothers me for them more than for me. They didn't endure. They didn't decide they wanted to stay committed. I, uh, I shared with this a long time ago, and it, it was one of those tragic realities in my life. Early in my ministry here, we had a, a group of men who had gone to a Promise Keepers conference. And man, they came back on fire. I mean, they came back ready to squirt, I mean, squirt gun charge hell. I mean, they were coming in, and they, they were willing to just spit on the devil and put him out. I mean, they were pumped up. They called us up to the pulpit. They, held, they were talking about how Aaron and her, and they had committed to themselves that they would be hers for me. That, that was Aaron and her were the ones who held up Moses' hands. And when he held up Moses' hands, and they, they backed Moses, and they stood with Moses, and they, every time they did, the enemy lost, and, and Moses and the people of Israel prevailed. And those men stood up here and held my hands high and prayed for me, prayed with me, and committed themselves to you as a congregation. Not one of those men are in church today. Not this church, any church. God's not talking about flip-flop Christianity. A good soldier doesn't serve like that. A good soldier's not uh, constantly on leave, amen? I don't look at it as leave, I look at it as AWOL. Amen? Now, I know everybody's got to take a little bit of time here and there and that kind of, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me this morning. But I'm talking about committed to the committed. And that's what he does. And then he endures. He endures hardness. Remember what Jesus said? It sounds so poetic, but I would to God we would visualize it and see it in our heart's mind and pray about it and really mean it when we say yes to this. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Oh, if I were to ask for hands this morning and say, how many of you want to follow Jesus Christ? Every one of you would raise your hand. But then when I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to lead this congregation in fasting every Wednesday. And we're going to come to the church and just pray all day on Wednesdays. You don't have to stay the whole time. Just come in. Pray and leave. Well, preacher, you know, I, I, I work on Wednesday. I understand that. That's good, though, okay? You can't come then. That's understandable. But could you fast at work? Could you pray while you drive down Blandy? You should be anyway. What would it take to get you to deny yourself? What would it take for us to truly say that spiritual thing, that spiritual fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ is more important than me being AWOL today? Christian Army's got a lot of missing in action, amen? I call it missing in no action. A reporter interviewed a young woman and she had uh, just completed the military training for recon for the Marines. <laughs> the reporter asked, was this what you had anticipated? The miles of the extra heavy backpacks? The crawling through mud under barbed wire with live rounds of ammunition being shot at your head? The sleep deprivation? The waterboarding? The torture? The having to endure the exact same treatment that the men did? Her response was, Sir, I'm a Marine. I signed up for this. Paul's telling Timothy, This is what you signed up for. 
Well, no, no. I, I signed up for the other Jesus stuff. I, I signed up for the other church stuff. You know, I, I, I signed up for the uh, sweet by and by. That's what I signed up for. I, I signed up for when everybody says, Ooh, that sure is good banana pudding. Who made that one for the fellowship? I, I signed up for the, the, the vacation Bible school where, where when, if the kids are acting up, I get to go on home. I signed up for the, for the fun part of the church. You, you mean there's work and, and struggle and pain and heartache and, and being a soldier kind of thing? That's, that, that didn't stop with Paul. No. No, it didn't. I ask you this morning, in all honesty, what did you sign up for? A lot of folks signed up for fire insurance policy. I'm going to ask Jesus to save me so I won't go to hell. Well, that's one of the benefits. But that's not the reason. I hope and pray to God that's not the reason. Listen to this statement by Charles Spurgeon. <laughs> all soldiers, all true soldiers, may not be good soldiers. There are those who are but just soldiers and nothing more. They need only sufficient temptation, and they readily become a coward, idle, useless, and worthless pack of camo in boots. But a good soldier is brave and courageous and at all times zealous and has his duty and his heart in all earnestness to say, like the Apostle Paul, I have fought a good fight. Wow. Spurgeon had a way with words, did he not? Once we move to the next step then, memorializing a good soldier's focus. In verse number 4, Paul writes in the first part of that verse, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. A good soldier has a different focus. His focus is not down here. His heavenly focus is up there. A good soldier is focused on right things. Colossians chapter 3, as Paul would write, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you're dead, and your life is hid in Christ. When Christ is our life, when he shall appear, then we shall appear with him in glory. You ever realize what soldiers give up? What first responders give up? When everybody's running away from fire, the fireman's running toward it. When everybody else is running away from shots fired, and the military and our police officers are running toward it, what are they risking? What are they saying? It's an un amazing thing. How many... Husbands and wives have kissed each other and then wondered. And just simply wondered. It happens, doesn't it? Good soldiers have to sacrifice some bad things. Good soldiers will sacrifice pride, won't they? Good soldiers will sacrifice independence. I love what Oliver North said one time. He said, I wasn't married, and I figured if I was supposed to get married, the Marines would have assigned me one. Amen. It does away with self-will. You're, you're not just a person anymore. You're, but wait a minute. Sometimes they have to sacrifice good things. Birthdays. A child's first words. A lonely wife. A grandmother's funeral. A home. A comfortable bed. Amen. 
But they do so because of the focus they have. They're focused on what it's all about. They focus themselves on the things above and not on things of this earth. They focus themselves on their mission. Why? Why would, why would they do that? And why do we, in our spiritual battle, being in the Lord's army, I used to love singing that song with kids. Well, the next one is, we memorialize a good soldier's desire. That same verse, the second part of that verse says, no man warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Why? That he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Timothy did not endure hardness. He did not put away things. He didn't just not entangle himself for any reason other than, I want to please my commanding officer. I want to please the one who gave me this calling. I want to please the one who outranks us all. I want to please the one whom I will bow down and worship or I will, quote unquote, salute. In Joshua chapter 5, the Lord Jesus Christ appears before Joshua and he says, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. That's our commander in chief. By the way, he's not weak. And he's not influenced by political polls. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is the right one to tell us what we should do and our response be, yes, sir. That comes with a true desire. Sometimes our desires are seen by what we allow to make us go AWOL. We, there's a lot of earthly things that pull us from the heavenly places. And we need to be a good soldier. And a good soldier has the desire to please his commander. The book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh his enemies to be at peace with him. Isn't it interesting? You don't have to battle the enemy when you're pleasing the Lord. Psalm 147, He delighteth not in the strength of the horse, he taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. You want to please God? It's not in your military might. It's not in the strength of your own body and your own legs. It's not in how strong a warfare you have with the strength of horses. It's your relationship with God. Do you fear him? Do you respect him? Do you honor him? To whom much is given, much is required. It, it, it scares me sometimes when we take what's been committed to us and try to commit it to faithful men, to commit to the committed, he says. And then when you watch them commit to the committed, you begin to watch them lose focus. You begin to watch them lose desire. You begin to watch nothing happen in the battlefield. That's a scary thought. That's a weak spot for the enemy to come and destroy us because we're not prepared for battle. I am so pleased with most of our workers that I've got them lesson plans that they teach in children's church and lessons plans that they teach on Wednesday nights. Why? That means they're ready for battle when it gets here. What a shame it would be if I were to walk up to you and go, what are you teaching tonight? And you say, I don't know. I hope and pray you wouldn't be like that on the battlefield. Is your gun loaded? I think it's around here somewhere. The military assigned me one. I cleaned it. I put it aside. I know it's around here somewhere. 
you're struggling with something in your life, and I say, have you prayed about it? And you go, well, I know how to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, how to be that? No, 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 no. Oh, you don't mean that prayer? No, no, that's the, that's the model prayer, not the Lord's prayer. You want to really know how to pray? Read John chapter 17. Oh, oh, you want another prayer? Okay. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. It's got a rhyme, right? Have we forgotten that we have weapons? And he has weapons of mass destruction. And we can't be ready if we're AWOL. And we can't be ready if my true desire is, I want to please Jesus. I, I really, I, when, when I finish this lesson, when I finish this class, when I finish this bus route, when I finish this song, when I finish this, this baking of a cake, when I finish this, this cleaning of the church, when I finish this, whatever it is, I want Jesus to say, well done. You did good. My focus is on pleasing him. And what's going to happen because of that? Memorialize a good soldier's testimony. If for some reason I die before you do, would you promise me you would make sure this gets put on my marker? I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. And I have kept the faith. That's all I want to truly live for. That's what the Apostle Paul would tell Timothy after he described the good soldier. He said, here's a good soldier's testimony. I fought. The word fight literally means agonize. He says, I have agonized with agonizing. I have fought the good fight. The word good is kalos. I have fought a fight that is beautiful, a fight that is profitable, a fight that is excellent, a fight that is delightful, a fight that is honorable, a fight that is distinguished, a fight that is noble. What I fought for was worth it. I agonized with agonizing, and I finished the course. You realize the reason... A person will not finish the course. There's only two. They quit or they get off track. The Apostle Paul uses that analogy of running a course in, in Hebrews chapter 12. He says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The word set before us means let us run our course. Let us run our track. I can't run your course. I can run my course. The problem is sometimes we quit running. And other times we just get off track. We're running some other course. There was no split in the road. We just jumped off track. Our course was straight. Our course was certain. Our course, we knew where to go. The Lord has set it before us. But there's only two things, again, that can slow us down. One, he says, lay aside every weight. <laughs> you remember when those ankle weights came out a long time ago? And all the runners used to wear them. They'd wear them before the race. And then they'd take them off and fly. It was like, man, I just shed 20 pounds. Well, you did. And you, your feet seemed to move faster. Have you ever been hiking and decided you want to take the backpack off? <laughs> and all of a sudden, you could move a little better because you laid aside the weights. You, the weights are encumbersome. He says to lay aside every weight. He did not say every weight was bad. Some weights are good. But sometimes you've got you to quit carrying stuff. If the stuff is stopping you or slowing you or encumbering you from having the testimony that I am going to finish my course, then get rid of it. 
What good is it going to do? It may be a good thing in your life, but is it getting you where God wants you? Or have you just gotten too much stuff? And then the second one is sin. And the sin that does so easily beset us. You say, which one is that? I don't know. I know mine. And let's be honest, you know yours. There's some sin somewhere that, boy, you just can't play around. You mess with it, and you're going to be right in it. Don't get close. He said, lay aside the, the weight and lay aside, push away from the sin that will just easily beset you. That will stop you from having a good soldier's testimony of fighting a good fight, of finishing your course. And then he says, what? I've kept the faith. I've kept the faith. Paul told Timothy earlier, he says, Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid vain and profane babbling as an opposition of science so-called. Some who are professing have erred concerning the grace. Timothy, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep. The word keep means guard. I have kept the faith means I have guarded. And notice the words, the faith. If you'd have been here the other uh, Wednesday night or so, we, we studied on what the faith was. And all of those things, he says, uh, it's not just faith, it's the faith. Paul says, basically, in all of my running, in all my struggling, in all of my conflict, in all of my labors, I have been very conscious of the sacred trust of the faith to obey it, proclaim it, and never compromise it. A good soldier has a great testimony. But then a good soldier has a reward. Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8 says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not unto me only, but unto all them also who love his appearing. Today, there are a select group of people in our country. They are known as gold star families. These gold star families have lost an immediate family member in the line of duty. The phrase gold star family dates all the way back to World War I. When military families would display service flags in their windows or on their doors, and they would have a blue star on it for every member of that household who was in active military duty in the armed forces. The star would change color to gold if someone were killed in action. These families would later receive a pin, a pin that had an interior of purple with a gold star embossed in it that said this is to memorialize your loved one's sacrifice. We call that an award. The family is awarded. But you know what? That's an award no family wants. I've never seen anybody in the military say, I hope and pray one day my family gets to be a gold star family. They're willing to sacrifice. And they're ready to sacrifice. But no one strives to see their mom pinned with a gold star. No one wants to see a young wife holding a little infant in her arms being pinned with a gold star. But we are in a different battle. And we don't get an award. We get a reward. We get a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not unto me only, but unto all them also. You see, when a good soldier fights, and a good soldier has his strength, and a good soldier has this testimony, the Lord looks at him and says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into rest, and here is the crown of your service to me. 
and he rewards us. And by the way, we don't keep it very long. We then throw them at the feet of Jesus. The Bible says when he comes back in all of his power and all of his glory, bringing his good soldiers with him, behind him, he will have on his head many diadem. The word diadem means crowns. The question this morning is, as we think and reflect, and rightly so, on the men and women who have sacrificed the greatest love and laid down their life for our country, for the first time ever, we are celebrating and honoring these men and women in a post-Christian America to where we're going to lose a lot of insight into why we do what we do. But in knowing that, that needs to enable us to strengthen ourselves, to realize I'm in the Lord's army. I'm in a spiritual battle. Am I setting the example of what a good soldier of Jesus Christ is? The question is yours. The question is yours to answer. Am I a good soldier of Jesus Christ? Let's pray together.